My name is Anjuman Tripathi and I welcome you all to the third and the most awaited lecture of this webinar series that is being organized by the Delhi University Faculty of Law Alumni Association. Today's speaker needs no introduction. She is a distinguished and deeply respected member of our fraternity. Her empathy for junior counsel in the courtroom has made her one of the most famous and admired judges among the young bar. It is all welcome, Honorable Madam Justice Jyoti Singh, who has graciously agreed to share her valuable time to address us on the topic recent changes in the arbitration law in India. Before we proceed any further, allow me to take you all to the glorious and inspiring journey of our distinguished speaker. Born in the year 1966, Honorable Madam Justice Jyoti Singh graduated from the Theodemal College, University of Delhi. She then obtained her LLB degree from the Faculty of Law, University of Delhi and enrolled as an advocate to the Bar Council of Delhi. She was designated as a senior advocate by the Delhi High Court in the year 2011. During her illustrious career, she held many important positions like senior counsel for the government of India. She specialized in the service matters, especially involving the armed forces and the paramilitary forces. She was appointed as the amicus curate in a number of cases by the Honorable High Court and the Armed Forces Tribunal. On 22nd October 2018, she was elevated as a judge of the Honorable High Court of Delhi. I, on behalf of the entire alumni family, welcome your ladyship to this webinar. Now, I would request your ladyship to start the lecture. Kindly allow me to pass on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Anjuman. Good evening, everybody. May I begin with first thanking the entire team who has organized this webinar today. May I also thank all those who are attending this webinar, uh, though I cannot see any one of you, but um, thank you for being here and joining in. Compliments and congratulations to the entire team who has actually succeeded in organizing this. In the adversities of today's times on account of the pandemic, I completely understand what a Herculean task it would have been for you to organize through the technology, getting all of us on one platform. We are all confined, cannot go to our offices, colleges, court complexes. But this initiative on your part of having got the learning process to our doorsteps, I think is commendable. And perhaps, as I see, till everything normalizes, is the only way forward. So congratulations and thank you. I'm really honored and privileged to be a part of this webinar today. Coming to the topic of today, which is the recent amendments in the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996. Well, this topic today is not only academically very interesting, but actually it become, becomes very significant. As we all know, for a couple of years, there were no amendments in the Act. And suddenly we've had a spate of amendments in the last six to seven years. There have been judicial orders thereafter. These amendments have been judicially interpreted. Some of them have been upheld. Some of them have been struck down. The most recent amendment, of course, is the 2019 amendment. To understand this amendment, we'll have to actually get back to the 2015 amendment because the later amendment is intrinsically linked to the 2015 amendment. The amendment of 2015 came through an Act 3 of 2016. It was based on the 246th Law Commission report. If one was to carefully analyze the report, of course, with the positive time may not be possible for me to take you through the report or uh, even to concentrate too much on each of the amendments and its details. But a careful analysis of the report shows that there were two factors which really concerned the Law Commission in actually proposing the amendments of 2015. And both these factors, if I may say, were the hallmarks of the arbitration proceedings and which were speedy and expeditious disposal. And the other was the least intervention by the courts. Keeping this in mind, the um, amendments came. There are a couple of them uh, which are very, very important in today's time, particularly relating to the procedures that we follow. 
So to begin with, I think the best way to go forward will be to take them up in a seriatim. Let me first begin with the First Amendment, which was in subsection 2 of section 2 of the Arbitration Act. In the year 2002, the Supreme Court in a case of Bhatia International felt that in international commercial arbitrations where one of the party is a foreign party, the party in India needed to have some interim relief when it was a foreign seated arbitration. So it said that part one, which contains a very important provision, which is section nine for interim relief, must actually apply to the even international commercial arbitrations. And therefore, that is the law that was set into motion. However, 10 years later, the constitutional bench in the famous case of Balco felt that actually part one and part two were totally based on territorial jurisdictions. And therefore, part one should never be applied in so far as foreign seated arbitrations were concerned. However, since this dealt with a lot of commercial matters with high stakes, the court felt that this should be prospective and overnight anything should not be upturned. Now, by the 2015 amendment, the proviso has been inserted to section subsection 2 of section 2. By virtue of this proviso, we are now back to that law of Bhatia International, where now in an international commercial arbitration, which is taking place outside India, which is also subject to the law and the rules outside India, Part 1 of the Act has been made applicable, which includes Section 9, Section 27, and some subsections of 37. This, of course, has been made subject to any agreement to the contrary, because at the end of the day, it's the party autonomy. So today, if an Indian party wants to seek an interim relief, even in a foreign-seated international commercial arbitration, resort can be had to Section 9 in the courts here in India. Subject to contrary is something which the courts will have to, of course, examine. Whether the parties have impliedly or expressly excluded, that's something which will have to be seen and for which one will have to fall back to the law of reliance and video con industries, etc., settled by the Supreme Court. So this was a very significant uh, amendment and the Law Commission looked into it, took, a, took an example, something that I'll, I'll quote out of the uh, Commission's report. For instance, there's a party in India and there is property here, which is a subject matter of arbitration and which needs to be preserved. Now, in a foreign seated arbitration, obviously the, the remedy of getting an interim relief before a tribunal there or a court there would be a little not so efficacious. And assuming there was an interim order, execution under CPC would not be possible because it will not be a decree. Again, if the foreign party doesn't obey the interim order, then the only remedy would be contempt, which again is something which is neither efficacious nor practical. So looking at all this, the uh, proviso was inserted, and this has come as a long way um, as an amendment. The Delhi High Court, another, uh, one of the matters, has also gone to the extent of saying that as far as the exclusion is concerned, it can be also implied and inferred, need not be expressed. And in yet another matter, the Delhi High Court has said that even in a matter where a party has gone to an emergency arbitrator outside India, even in that case, the courts here under a section 9, if the uh, proviso has not been excluded, can certainly examine the matter for an interim relief if warranted completely independent of the order of the emergency arbitrator. So this is the first amendment. Now the second amendment that we shall discuss would be about section 8. Now section 8 has been amended in two ways. Section 8 as we all know when one party files a suit but there is an arbitration agreement between the parties, the defendant is entitled to go to the court and say there is an arbitration agreement. The amendments that have been carried out are, one is that now anybody on and behalf of a party can approach and file this application, asking the court to refer the matter to arbitration and not proceed with a civil suit. The other amendment is, again, in keeping with the factors of expeditious disposal, 
the ethos of arbitration being an agreed alternative dispute re resolution mechanism is that the courts will now not interfere in this. If the court feels that prima facie there is an arbitration agreement, the court would then refer the matter to the arbitral tribunal. All other issues ancillary to it will be left to the wisdom and jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, which it shall decide under section 16 of the Act. Section 9 is the next section which has undergone amendment. And significantly, if I may say, Section 9 has had two amendments under 2015 Act. One is that now there is a time frame of 90 days within which the arbitration must commence in case there is an interim order passed by the court. So if a party approaches the court and there is an interim order protecting the property, staying the bank guarantees or whatever those interim orders are, that party must necessarily commence arbitration proceedings within 90 days. The purpose is clear and laudable that somebody who takes an interim order should not just sleep over it because as you can imagine the situation will be if a party has an interim order then the best bargain will be to keep sitting over it and not let the proceedings move on which would be totally against the fundamentals of arbitration. So this is one amendment, section uh, 9 has been amended, subsection 2 has been added. The other amendment is subsection 3 that has been added to section 9. Now section 9, 3 says that if the arbitral tribunal is in place, it has been constituted, then in that case the parties would not come to the court under section 9 for seeking an interim relief. The reason is obvious that there is a mechanism you decided on. Now the tribunal is there, so go to the tribunal and under section 17, the parties have a remedy to seek the same relief. So the courts will not interfere in such a case and it will be in very extenuating and very, very special circumstances that the court will interfere and give relief under section 9 once the tribunal is in place. The next amendment that is really, really a matter of debate also these days and is very important because uh, Section 11 is something which is invoked day in and day out in the courts. Section 11 has undergone an amendment by an insertion of sec subsection 6 capital A, as we popularly call, call it Section 11 6A. Now, this section mandates the court that while the court is examining a petition under section 11 for appointment of an arbitrator, the court will limit itself only to seeing whether there is in an existence an arbitration agreement. Parties, as you know, in their agreements agree to arbitration as a mechanism, but many a times it happens that one party gives a notice and the other party does not appoint. So within 30 days, if it doesn't happen, the party can take a recourse to the court for appointment. If it's international commercial arbitration, the Supreme Court appoints. If it's other than that, the High Court appoints. Now, earlier the law was way back when the Konkan Railway came, case came, the uh, pronouncements were that appointment of the arbitrator is an administrative action. This was overruled by the judgment in the SPP case, which we all know. And it was said, this is a judicial function. In addition to this, it was since it was a judicial function now, it was also said that the appeal will lie to the Supreme Court under Article 136. As far as this case goes, it was, it was a case where it, the judicial activism had actually begun by saying that, well, there are certain things which the court must see, but there are certain things which must be left to the tribunal. So this was really the starting point of the genesis of 116A. After this came the case of Polyfab. Here, there was a little dilution again. And the court said, well, there will be three categories. And these categorizations will have to be seen when the courts are appointing the arbitrators. So some cases were put into categories where the court was told that this is a mandate that you would not look into it, like the merits, etc. It will go to the tribunal. 
one was a category where the uh, court had to look into and the third was a category where it was left to the court to decide or make a choice to leave it to the tribunal. Keeping all this in view, the Law Commission then gave its, as I said, the 246 report. So this was also one of the considerations before the Law Commission. And the Law Commission felt that perhaps the job of the court was only to look into if there was an existence of the arbitration agreement and no more. The niceties and other things would have to be left to the tribunal. Pursuant to this then came the insertion of 116A. And today, the situation as it per uh, pertains is this, that while examining a petition under 11, the only and the only consideration before a court would be whether there is in existence an arbitration agreement between the parties and no more and no less. All other issues, whether the disputes are arbitrable, the long time barred claims, etc., would have to be left to the tribunal. The uh, recent judgment of the Supreme Court has even gone to the extent of saying even the question of limitation being a question of mixed question of fact and law would have to be left to the tribunal. But having said that, uh, it's not as if the court will not look into some of the fundamental issues while examining Section 11. And which is, of course, the territorial jurisdiction of the court where this concept of seat and venue exclusive jurisdiction will come in. <clears throat> and in addition to this, the eligibility and the ineligibility of an arbitrator is something which will also concern the court. Connected to this is the amendment to section 12. So I'll deal with both of them together. Now, section 12 is, is another section which is, I, according to me, very, very crucial and is the foundation of the pyramid of arbitration. Section 12 has had two amendments. One of the amendments is in the first part of section 12, that is subsection 1. Here, the arbitrator has to be a person whose partiality and independence has to be beyond question. And these parameters are given in Schedule 5 to the Act. The second amendment is subsection 5. Here, the subsection itself begins with a non obstante clause notwithstanding any other agreement, etc., to the contrary, which means that if there is an arbitrator who is ineligible to be appointed as an arbitrator, then that's the end of the matter. The ineligibility will go to the root and he cannot be appointed. The parameters for judging under Section 12.5 are given in Schedule 7. So after this amendment, now when the courts appoint arbitrators under Section 11, there are two facets that also have to be seen. One is the factor of the ineligibility of an arbitrator. The arbitrator is called upon at the very outset to give a declaration that he is eligible, that the disabilities mentioned in the schedules are not there and he is free from any impediment to move ahead with the arbitration. Recently, also, we've had uh, various judgments which have interpreted on the eligibility of the arbitrators, which are in keeping with, again, as I say, the authors of the arbitration. So the unilateral appointments, etc., all that have now been done away with. So Section 12 has come, I think, as a great respite because this declaration at the beginning of the arbitration is something which will, I think, inure to everyone's advantage. Instead of discovering it at a later stage, having gone through a part of it, uh, is something which, which is not in the uh, interest of any of the parties. So Section 12 has been um, amended accordingly. Section 17 has undergone um, an important uh, amendment as well. As we all know that uh, the powers of the tribunal were there always to give interim orders under Section 17 in aid of arbitration, preserving the subject matter of the arbitration. But as was always said in um, the various cases of um, Sundaram Finance and the Army Welfare uh, Housing Organization, etc., that when orders were passed, the tribunal to that extent was more or less a toothless tribunal because these orders were not enforceable like any other court order. So the amendment which has come under Section 17 is very significant and it is in two ways. A, 
the orders which are now passed by the tribunal under section 17 will be equally enforceable as any other decree of the court. So anyone who wants to flout it has to be now careful. Secondly, the powers of the tribunal under section 17 have been brought completely at par of the high court under section 9. So whatever orders the court can pass under section 9, the tribunal can pass under section 17. So these are the two amendments which have come under section 17. As far as section 34 is concerned, well, the amendment as such is short because there's been an explanation which has been added where the public policy, which is the ground of interference, has now been restricted to three categories, fraud, corruption, while making the award, then there is fundamental policy of Indian law and conflict with justice and morality. And another explanation has been added that there will be no review on merits. But the importance of this section 34 is, of course, um, is one section. If I was to address on it, perhaps uh, hours would not be enough. So I don't want to get into too many details other than saying that these amendments in section 34 are basically aimed at least intervention by the court. Earlier you had still parts and uh, you know there were judicial reviews and there were judgments which said that there were certain spheres which you could interfere with. The arbitrator decides against the terms of the contract, there's patent illegality, all of that. But today by virtue of this section the uh, scope of interference has been completely narrowed down. Patent illegality is gone to a different level. In international arbitration, of course, it's completely out now. Only public policy remains. So Section 34 has come with the purpose of least court intervention, and rightly so. Parties have chosen a mechanism for resolution. They must be bound by it. So as far as 34 is concerned, it has been now recently interpreted by uh, two judgments of the Supreme Court in Sangyong and HCC, where the courts have said we are not an appellate court sitting under Section 34. We cannot treat it as an appeal or as a review, and the parameters are extremely narrow. The other amendment which has come again in keeping with the expeditious disposal is an amendment to section 29a now in 2015 when this amendment came there were timelines which were set for the arbitral uh, tribunal to proceed so there was a statutory period of 12 months which was given within which the proceedings had to finish of course the parties by their consent could extend the time period by six months and this power and prerogative also lay with the tribunal. Beyond this extended period, of course, uh, only the court could be approached, which could extend the time, but for, of course, sufficient reasons. So these time limits were um, then set into motion. 29B was also added as a fast track mechanism. And the parties now could agree and at any stage and say, well, we do not want to leave evidence. And as a fast track mode, we would like for an expeditious disposal, rely on the evidence and the documents which are already there, the pleadings, etc. And we do not want to leave any further evidence. So these were the amendments. In so far as section 36 is concerned, I would like to deal with it when I come to the 2019 amendments because it has a, a great connection uh, with the 2019 amendments. So the crucial amendments as we discussed under the 2015 acts were primarily these. And then we've had uh, judicial uh, orders which have interpreted these uh, judgments. Last in 2019, we've had a whole lot of judgments which have interpreted both section 11 and section uh, 29A and section 34 in many, many ways. Now, after the 2015 amendment, the next amendment that we see today is the 2019 amendment. The amendments under 2019 have to be seen with a caveat, and which is that even today, and there's a lot of confusion that um, prevails even today about 
the amendments in the 2019 Act. A lot of these amendments have been notified, but there are some amendments which have not been notified even today. So the notification was 30th of August and 9th of August of 2019, but there are some amendments which are proposed but have not been notified. So that is a distinction which we will have to draw talking about 2019 amendments. Now, under the 2019 amendments, if we look at it, the first thing that has happened here is that we all know the amendments arose out of a high level committee which was constituted under the chairmanship of Justice Sri Krishna. The purpose of having this committee was twofold. One was that the committee primarily focused on promotion, on promotion of institutional arbitration. And the second was with regard to the timelines that must be drawn for the proceedings so that matters of commercial transactions do not go on and on. Keeping this in mind, the amendments that came, which one of them, which is still not notified, of course, is, is the proposal was introduction of 1A to the Act. Now, 1A of the Act envisages the constitution of a statutory body called Arbitration Council of India. Now, this is to be headed by the um, retired uh, Chief Justice of the High Court or the Judge of the Supreme Court, and uh, that's all mentioned therein. It also includes as uh, the government official, as an ex-officio member. It also includes with it a uh, recognized body of the, uh, the commercial uh, world today. Then it's also supposed to have eminent arbitration practitioners and eminent acad academicians in it. So the council will be tasked as and when it is formed with framing policies, uh, governing the grading of the arbitral uh, institutions and arbitrators, recognizing their professional institutes, uh, which provide the accreditation of the arbitrators. It will also aim primarily at modes of resolution other than courts, such as the mediation, conciliation, etc. Schedule 8 has also been proposed in this amendment because a lot is sometimes debated about the qualifications of the arbitrators. So at times it is felt that they are not qualified enough for technical matters, the technical know-hows are missing, they are not qualified enough if they are other than uh, lawyers or judges, they don't have too much of know-how of the um, law, the Evidence Act. So there's always been a debate of the qualifications of the arbitrators and what should be the do's and don'ts about appointing the arbitrators. So Schedule 8, which is proposed is, will now lay down the qualifications which are to be possessed by a person before he becomes a recognized arbitrator for the Arbitration Council of India. Uh, the other amendment uh, which is proposed is to Section 11. As we just discussed a while ago, under Section 11, the court appoints the arbitrators in case the parties are not ad item and they're unable to decide amongst themselves, then they approach the court uh, under Section 11, 5 and 6. If it's an international arbitration, the Supreme Court appoints, other arbitrations, the High Court appoints. So since the whole purpose of this uh, committee really was to look at institutional arbitrations, the proposed amendment also looks at actually arbitrators being appointed by institutions rather than the courts. And these institutions, well, it's not as if institutions will not be picked up or it will be a random selection. The institutes will be also set up by the Supreme Courts and the High Courts. And then, of course, mechanisms and modalities would be put in place. So instead of going to the court, now these institutions will be approached for appointment to the arbitrators. The rationale as given in the report is that A, it will be speedier. B, it will reduce the um, litigation burden on the courts. And since these institutions will have their own mechanisms, will have their own experts in place, uh, the appointment will be faster 
and they will be able to look into the nitty gritties and the niceties of the appointment, the arbitrators, their eligibilities, etc. So section 11 is uh, proposed to be amended in this way. Section 17 also is, has an amendment. Earlier, as I just told you a while ago, that under section 17, the uh, powers of the tribunal were brought at par with powers of the court under section 9. And the orders passed with the tribunal were made enforceable to give teeth, obviously, to the tribunal. You can't have a toothless tribunal. You can't have orders which can't be implemented or enforced. But one other facet of the unamended section 17 was that the tribunal had the power to give an interim relief if sought for and warranted, of course, during the arbitration proceedings and post the passing of the award. So, for instance, if you if a party had an award in its favor and it felt that the other party may dissipate the subject matter, it may sell off the property or whatever is the subject matter and it needed the tribunal to preserve the property so that tomorrow when it time comes for it to have the award enforced, the subject matter should be intact. So the tribunal was given the power under the unamended section 17 to pass that post award interim order. Now in the 2019 amendment, this later part has been amended and taken away. So today, as it stands, the power of the tribunal is to grant interim relief only and only during the arbitration proceedings. And so for post award interim reliefs, one will have to naturally approach under section nine of the act. Section 29A has also gone undergone an amendment. The timelines that were set under section 29A in the 15 amendment were, tw were 12 months statutory period for passing of the award. The commencement of the 12 months period was when the arbitral tribunal entered upon reference. Now, under the amendment, the commencement period has been amended. The commencement has now changed from the entering upon reference to when the pleadings are completed. So the moment the pleadings are complete, the clock starts ticking and 12 months statutory period is counted from there on. But it's not as if this is a, an unlimited period. So you have a capping because one would wonder that if it's from pleadings, where would this end? Uh, one can go on and on with pleadings and we are back to square one. But fortunately, section 23 is there and which has capped the period within which the tribunal and the parties would uh, complete the pleadings and which is a six months outer limit. So today, as, as it stands, section 29A, because this is a section which is very often invoked and resorted to, so it's very important to understand this amendment. There is, of course, a debate on in matters where already extensions have taken place through the courts and otherwise, how would this law apply prospectively, retrospectively? At the end of the day, it's a procedural law. So all those are still open. However, the situation as it stands today by way of the amendment is that 12 months statutory period from the date the pleadings are completed would start. So that is the amendment to 29A. The other amendment that I would like to now discuss on this platform is, is an interrelated issue between section 36 and section 87 as inserted by the 2019. And, and, and I would say was because as of today, as I speak here, it's struck down. So that, but this this entire facet has a has a great bearing on the arbitration today. Section thirty six before it stood, before the twenty fifteen amendment. Now we'll have to go to that little backdrop to understand this entire chronology. Before the twenty fifteen amendment came, it was understood that when a party which was aggrieved by an award went to a court and filed objections. The mere filing of that objection petition 
entailed an automatic stay of the award because 36 as it stood read the way it did because it only said that if the time for making the award has expired and there is no application then that's the end of the matter so the entire uh, thinking at that time was that there is an automatic stay. Now this, of course, was leading to a situation where there was a successful party having an award in its favor. But by a mere filing of an objection petition, of course, within the time frame that are given for the objections, and having an automatic stay, it was very easy for the aggrieved party to keep the litigation in a limbo. And obviously the party who had an award in his favor was being deprived of the fruits of the award. So this resulted in prolonged litigation, the aggrieved party not interested in prosecuting litigation. And again, as I said, this is not what the arbitration was all about. So the law commission again looked into it and thought that this needed to be remedied. In 2004, the Supreme Court in one of the judgments had also looked into this issue. The Supreme Court looked at the section and thought that looking at the section, well, the legislative intent seemed to be that there should be an automatic stay. So the Supreme Court said that the discretion of the court to stay or not to stay an award was not there. But having said that, the Supreme Court did, in the case of Nalco, express its anguish. In so many words, the court noted that this is not in keeping with the basic fundamental ethos of the arbitrate, arbitration proceedings. So the automatic stay is something which was a subject matter of debate also, and the Law Commission also therefore looked into it. And then came the 2015 amendment and section 36 was amended. Now, this was a very significant amendment. By virtue of this amendment, two, three things happened. A, it was made clear by the statute itself that if the aggrieved party approaches the court and files objections, there will be no automatic stake. Two, the party aggrieved will have to move a separate application before the court and seek a stay of the enforcement of the award. The third and the most significant thing was that when the stay application was, is filed, it is now the discretion of the court, of course, looking at the case, the prime of SI case set up by the objector, looking at the parameters of law, looking at the scope of interference in judicial review, all that parameter is being looked into. If the court feels that it is an award which deserves to be stayed on a highest threshold of section 34, then the court has the discretion to stay the award. But again, while staying the award, the court also has the power and the discretion to impose terms. So it can tell the objector that while I'm staying the award, these are the terms on which you will be put to. So those could be by way of deposit the, depositing the awarded amount in the court, which could be varying percentage. The recent trend of law, of course, is that nearly 90, 80% or sometimes even 100% is directed to be deposited by the court. The successful party, which is a respondent, is permitted to take away that money and enjoy the fruits because as the Supreme Court said in one of the judgments, the litigations go on and on. So the court can put the party to terms. So any party who now comes seeking stay of the award will have to deposit money in the court. And therefore, naturally, in the long run, such a party would not want the matter to be delayed, but would be interested in its quick disposal and would prosecute it with diligence and seriousness. So this is a crucial amendment. And after this, also, the other uh, facet of 36 is that when it, the award is a money, it relates to uh, the payment of money. Then the section also says that the principles as applicable to money decrease would be applied while staying the award. 
So this is the position which ordained between the 2015 amendment <coughs> till 2019. In 2019, when the amendment came, section 87 was inserted. Now what the section did was this. It repealed section 26 of the 2015 Act, which had given certain commencement date of applicability of the amendment. And also, the section laid down that as far as the proceedings, both arbitral and the court proceedings relating to or arising around of arbitral proceedings, which have commenced prior to the Amendment Act, that is prior to 23rd October 2015, which is the date from which the 2015 Act came to be applied, will not be governed by the amendment. And the arbitral proceedings and the court proceedings initiated or commenced as, as the word used in section 21 after this date would be governed by the amendment act. So the result was that if there were court proceedings which were in the pipeline which related to arbitral proceedings having commenced prior to the amendment they lost out on the benefit of 36. So as far as they were concerned, the situation was back to the pre-amended stage of an automatic state. Now, this issue was also examined by uh, the court, Supreme Court in BCCI's case in great details. And after going into the uh, various issues, the court felt that this would be a situation which will go against the whole purpose of amendment because if the petitions which were in the pipeline or petitions which are pending proceedings pending prior to 2015 if they are not to be given the benefit of this very crucial amendment then in that case the whole purpose is lost so in the bcci case the court had expressed its uh, hope that the amendment would not happen because the amendment was in the pipeline at that point in time However, the amendment did come and 87 was introduced. But recently, in a judgment by the Supreme Court in HCC, the Supreme Court had the occasion to look into the constitutional validity of this amendment. The court went into details of analyzing the entire history of the pre-amendment, why the 2015 amendment came, what was the effect of automatic stay on pending litigation, how it was defeating the whole purpose of having an award. In fact, it was also defeating the purpose of uh, judicial intervention into the awards. So the Supreme Court in the HCC case went into detail and by a detailed judgment, it struck down Section 87. And what the Supreme Court said was this, that if we were to apply this section, then we go back to the earlier point in time the result will be that the clock is reversed. The result will be that now the other aspect was also analyzed by the court as a, as a great fallout. Now, between 2015 and 2019, obviously, we would have had several cases where the parties, the respondent, the successful parties would have taken their money. Now, this section 87 not only amended this entire structure, but also made the amendment effective from 23rd October 2015. So the Supreme Court said that the direct fallout of this is that people who've taken their money and gone home and have enjoyed it would perhaps be asked to refund, which the Supreme Court thought wasn't right. And this distinction was done away with by the Supreme Court that you can't have an amendment of this nature, which has come with a purpose to proceedings which are post the amendment and commencing from 23rd 15 onwards, 23rd October 15 onwards, and not to apply to the proceedings prior thereto. So 87 has been now struck off. So today the situation in law is that we are, back, we are now in the stage of 2015 amendment. Today, if a party is aggrieved with an award, an application will have to be filed and the court will have, the court then during its examination will have the discretion to see a, if there is a prime of SI case for interference at all, <clears throat> B, if there is and uh, a stay is warranted, then the party will have to be subjected to various uh, terms and conditions. And this, of course, inures in favor of the successful party who naturally has his award. 
so in a nutshell <clears throat> because of the paucity of time i may not be able to share a lot many judgments etc with you but this is really the uh, birds i view of the two arbitrations in a nutshell uh, i can now leave it to the organizers if there are any questions that anyone wants to put good evening madam good evening Uh, as i understand is this question relating to section 8 yes ma'am section 8 all right i'll just attempt to answer this uh, so we'll yes, so um, as i said that section 8 has been amended so as to uh, you know get the interference of the court to the least and the court has been given uh, just the power to see prima facie that there is an arbitration clause and if there is to refer the parties to uh, the arbitral tribunal keeping in bargain which they have entered into now there are timelines also given so if the party wants to approach the civil court as a defendant obviously because the plaintiff is the one who has filed the civil suit so if the defendant wants to approach the court civil court and tell the court that there is an arbitration clause and therefore the suit is not maintainable in fact the uh, party does not need to file a written statement at all all that the party needs to do is to move a simple application i think there is a timeline uh, if i am not wrong of about 120 days or something i am not very sure of that um, timeline but there is a timeline within which that party the defendant can approach the civil court for um, seeking reference to the arbitral tribunal but in case if the in case the defendant was to file a written statement in fact it will be to the reverse then it will be as if you have waived your rights under the arbitration agreement you have equinced in the proceedings so the the only thing that the defendant needs to do is to file a simple application and not file a written statement at all certainly not so hail the answer to this question is absolutely a no see uh, and and there's a simple logic to this uh, arbitrator is a creator of the contract between the parties two parties enter into a bargain and say that look if there are any disputes tomorrow relating to our agreement then the mode and the forum of our resolution will be arbitration and from here takes the uh, the here comes the arbitrator in picture so being a creature of the contract and therefore completely bound by the terms of the contract the arbitrator cannot venture outside the terms of the contract so and and of course we have judgments like the associate builders and mcdermott in the supreme court uh, there's a whole series of these judgments which say that the arbitrator cannot go outside the terms of the contract being a creature of it so judicial activism sounds nice but is certainly not the power and prerogative of an arbitrator in my opinion so now ma'am now we have the third question Six out of the seven members of the proposed arbitration council of India appointed by the central government, or are the employees of the central government? Will this not affect the neutrality of the arbitrators who will be appointed in the arbitrations of the central government? So, well, firstly, uh, I don't think so. It's very appropriate for me to to even comment or answer this question. however i um, <clears throat> i would only answer it by saying that at the moment this uh, council is yet to take birth this all proposed 
so we don't know how the um, council will be what will be the modalities what will be the finesses attached to it so it's too pre premature for us to see i'm sure once the council is put in place there will be uh, do's and don'ts and uh, debtors that will be put on it but at, at this stage it's not right to answer this question i think it's premature and for me completely inappropriate Well, so well, um, my personal opinion is what I'm giving. It's yes. it's just a personal opinion. Uh, well, perhaps um, this is true uh, because when an objection is raised, and I'm repeating, it's my personal opinion. When an objection is raised um, under Section 13, uh, the mechanism is that uh, if the arbitral tribunal decides against the applicant and decides to proceed with the proceedings, rehold the objection to the appointment of the arbitrator, then the only remedy as of today in the statute is to wait until the award comes and objections are filed um, under Section 34. Well, it, it, is, it is, to my mind, a little lacuna. But since this is the statute, I think it only needs a legislative amendment or and maybe an interpretation somewhere, but uh, it's true that this is a problem. It will be better if these things, according to me, are sorted out at the earliest, which is why, um, as I just uh, told you briefly, Section 12 was amended for asking the arbitrator to give a declaration and all of that. So keeping in it, perhaps this does need a revisit. Yes. So, well, I, I may not be wrong if I say that um, the eighth schedule, which is uh, dealing with the qualifications, has not yet been notified, if I'm not wrong. So, um, I can't comment on this as and when it will be notified. However, uh, I, I recollect reading somewhere, which was some report, I don't know where that was, um, Perhaps the report said that it was um, not meant to apply. This was, just, this was just a report which I'd read somewhere. I don't know if it was the Law Commission's report or some paper that I read, but it, it did say that it wasn't meant to apply. But to the best of my knowledge, 8th schedule is yet to be notified. So we'll have to wait and see what ultimately um, sort of comes out of it. Thank you so much, ma'am. I want to conclude the seminar. To start by saying, what an insightful and valuable session it was. I would like to convey my heartiest best to the Honorable Keeping Speaker, Honorable Singh of the Honorable Delhi High Court, who took out time of a busy schedule to educate us all about the recent amendments in our arbitration law, which is very crucial at this time in the I take this opportunity to put all my gratitude to the words here saying. Do not, not let this tough times of pandemic put any hamper to the craft of learning and education. And I, on behalf of all the organizing team, hope that in future too we continue to get enlightened by the honorable justice and rich education and law. On behalf of everyone involved in this, I thank all the viewers and special keynote speaker for the various participations. We hereby conclude the webinar on a very positive. Be at home, stay safe. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. All of you, stay home, stay safe. All the best.